In this tutorial, we're going to go through all the options in the profiling toolpath um, strategy. So I'm going to start by creating a, a, a file to work on. I'm just going to create a new file here. I'm going to make it 12 inches by 12 inches, so a foot square and just half an inch thick and create our work area. So our work area is a foot square. And then I'm going to draw just a, a square in the center here. So if I hold down the control key as I draw, I, I shall uh, with this draw rectangle form open, that actually forces it to be a square. So I'm holding down the control key as I do that. Close that down. With this square selected, I can press F9 to center it on our work area. So now we have something that we're going to profile and let's cut across to the profiling, the toolpath tab to open the profiling tool strategy. Okay, so the profiling toolpath is conceptually one of the simplest toolpaths that we have. It's the one that essentially runs the tool along the selected um, vector geometry that we pass into it. However, because it's um, so useful, it has many options. And so what we're going to do at the moment is we're going to work through uh, all of those options so that you can see the different circumstances. Uh, but what I want to do initially is highlight this uh, um, checkbox at the beginning of the 2D toolpath, which I currently have unchecked. Uh, so the idea here is that there are many options for the tool profiling toolpath which most customers do not need. Uh, and so to avoid them becoming uh, a bit of a distraction, um, there is a, essentially um, a simple mode for the profiling as there is for the pocketing as well. So I'm going to just go through the simple, the basic 2D profile toolpath uh, options with the advanced toolpath options hidden. So this box is unchecked at the moment. Then we'll come back, I'll check that on and we'll go through the extra stuff that appears when you do that. In general, um, we'd recommend basically that you, you, you're either the sort of person that needs the advanced 2D toolpath stuff or you're not. And uh, if you don't really require it, then it's just way simpler if you just turn that off. And this will still give you 99% of, of what most customers need for um, profiling. Okay, so let's start at the top of the form now and look at the cutting depths. So the first the, uh, item I get to put in here is a start depth. Now the start depth is effectively the depth before we start cutting. And the reason that we have this is in case you want to profile at the bottom of pockets, which is a very common thing to do. So if you've already pocketed out a shape to a fixed depth, then you don't want the uh, toolpath to essentially cut air while it gets down to the depth of the pocket before it starts properly cutting the profile. So this allows you to say, no, I'm, I'm going to be profiling, but inside a pocket that's already been cut of a certain depth. Uh, and you can enter that value here. Uh, in this case, and in most cases, if you're just working on profiling uh, from the top of your material block, say, then this value will be zero, and that's fine. Uh, now we're going to put in the depth of our cut. Now remember our material was half an inch thick, uh, so I can actually, um, if I want to cut through this, let's say this is a cutout pass which we're intending to actually cut this square out of our material, I can actually do, um, I could either enter 0 0.5, that's fine, um, but also a really cool thing is that you can just type Z. Z is a special value um, inside the software and it will always be replaced by the current thickness of the software. If I press Z and press equals, it automatically fills that in for me. So the Z equals has become 0.5. Uh, but I can also leave it as Z and that will become stored with this toolpath so that at any later date, if I change the material thickness and recalculate the toolpath, it will find out what that um, material block thickness is and replace that value for me. So I can just leave that without pressing equals um, with the letter Z in it. And effectively from now on, this toolpath is tied to the uh, current uh, Z depth of our material. So that's really handy, particularly for cutout passes. Okay, so the next section here is choosing the tool itself that we're going to use to cut. And there are two buttons here that sometimes uh, people are a little bit unsure about. The selection brings up our tool database. So this is tools that we actually want to use and reuse, uh, and it allows us to store the, uh, a set of, of tools that are commonly uh, required. And so if we want to add a tool in or modify a tool that we're going to use time and time again, this is the place to create a new tool, uh, a new definition, and have a look at the tool database tutorial videos for more details on that. But it allows you to select the tool and click OK, and the value is placed in here. If I tooltip over this, by the way, so I'm ho just hovering over it, it tells me the tree location, imperial tools and end mills that this tool came from. So it helps you if you've got several end mill, quarter inch end mills, for example, but with different feeds and speeds or different properties, then knowing where they are in the database is handy. So this might tell you, for example, this was the imperial tool end mill soft material uh, property settings.
Okay, so that's what the select button does. The select button simply allows you to pick something from your existing tool database. The edit button is slightly different. So the edit button allows you to pick this tool specifically for this toolpath. So the changes that we make on this form will only affect the 2D profile toolpath. They will not affect the general entry in our database for the end mill. Okay, so this is the way that you just do a, a, a local modification that you're not intending to save. It's very particular to the t particular job you're working on, but it allows you to modify some things in here. We're going to come back to this in a second when we look at past depths, okay? But just to know the difference between selecting from your database and editing the tool once you've selected it. Um, in the first case, you're looking at the tools that you're going to share and reuse, and in the second case, you're looking at the properties that you just want to modify for this particular toolpath. Okay, so moving on to the next section. The next section hopefully is relatively straightforward and the diagram gives you most of the information you need. Um, so what it's saying is, but relative to this uh, infinitely thin line, where actually are we going to run our tool of a given diameter? It can either run, um, so its edge is on the outside of this shape, on the inside, or we can put the center line of the tool along the job. So that's really what we're showing here, running the tool around the outside around the inside of the shape or actually center lined on the shape itself. Um, generally speaking, you know, we get, if a cutout path, we're going to run it around the outside here. Now the direction of cuts um, is um, something you may or may not be familiar with uh, to do with general uh, CNC milling principles. Uh, and essentially what this, this does is swap the direction of that we move the tool around the shape. Uh, but the practical upshot of that is it has a very profound effect on how the cutter teeth on the spinning tool engage the material. Uh, and there isn't really a right or wrong answer here. This really depends on your machine and the material you're cutting and what you're trying to achieve in terms of uh, edge finish versus tool wear and tear and things like that. Uh, but the two different um, options here, simply move the tool um, round the, the job in the opposite direction uh, and that will change how the teeth of the tool spinning um, take off chips of material. Now my one top tip that I can give you about choosing this if you're not sure which direction um, you want to use is to run a test job on the material that you're cutting just just run a profile pass around it and take a look at the surface finish on both the part the part that you actually want and also the outside waste material so the the other um, side of the cut if you like. So look at the surface finish on the waste material. If the surface finish you're getting on the inside edge of your waste material is better than your part then you simply want to swap the direction here and that will place if you like the better surface finish on your part edge which is nearly always what you want. So that's a simple tip if you're not sure which of these to, to use. Okay so let's calculate that now so we can take a look at the resulting tool path. Um, and take a look at, it, at one of the issues that uh, people uh, sometimes ask about, which is, is where the number of passes is coming from. So if we take a look now closely at this toolpath, we can see that cutting through our half-inch material with that particular tool has taken four passes. So we're taking four goes round the uh, profile to get down to full cut depth. Where's that value coming from? Okay, so let's go back to our tool and take a look again using the edit box at the tool parameters and when we open that there is the pass depth value here uh, that is specific to this particular tool so this is telling us what we believe this tool at these fees and speeds can cut into this material in a single pass and at the moment it's 0.125 and so it's taking four of these passes to get down to the full half inch depth we could make this quarter of an inch instead so go to two five OK, and recalculate that, and we'll find now we're allowing the tool to come in and just hit this in two passes, because we've said that this tool is capable at the feed and speeds that we have set there and in this material to, to get through this material in just two passes. So that's where the passes come from. They come from that property of the tool itself. OK, so the next thing then, let's come back to our toolpath. Each time, by the way, I'm just simply double-clicking on the toolpath to reopen it for editing. So I'm coming back into the same toolpath to edit it again. And let's look at the ramp plunge moves option here. So what this is doing is saying, rather than plunging straight down into the job, let's come into this job um, using more gentle uh, approaches into the material. So we're not going to plunge straight down, we're going to come in on a ramp. And the ramp will be a zigzag, and um, the value we get to uh, choose here is what the distance is of each of the uh, zigzag passes, if you like. So let's start with something big, let's go for three inches here, recalculate that, and we can see now that our tool is not is only plunging a small way in here, then it's coming down 
in a long zigzag into the material as it comes into the material so it's doing a much more gentle cut into the material as it comes down to the depth of the actual pass and before it goes to the next pass it does the same again so the ramping uh, assists you down the straight edge here particularly to um, get in and out the material get into the material in a very controlled way now you can reduce the length of that if I double click this again and we go to one inch you'll see that we just shorten that ramping distance effectively making it a steeper engagement um, in this particular case so you can modify that according to your requirements so that's ramping the final thing then let's just calculate this tool uh, path and preview it so that you can see what the end result is initially so this is great it shows us the uh, objects being completely cut out I can double click to remove the waste material and we can see in the, the preview here what that finished part will look like so that's great but of course in the real world that would probably um, separate as it got down to the final part of the cut here it would separate unless we had a vacuum bed holding it in place <clears throat> and that would uh, cause the part to fly out so what we often want to do is leave some small tabs in place just to hold the part in uh, during the final parts of the cut and then at the end we can manually just trim through those tabs to remove the part and that will hold it securely throughout throughout the cut so how do we set those let's go back to our profile here and we can see that we can add tabs to our toolpath and if I check that on the first thing I can fill in here is um, the length of the tab and also its thickness so hopefully that's relatively um, self-explanatory so I've got an eighth of an inch thick tab and I'm going to make them half an inch long okay that's probably quite big actually but let's leave it like that because it's easier for you to see but you can just experiment with these uh, essentially you want your tabs to be the minimum really the minimum length and thickness um, that you can get away with that won't break and hold the, t the part in place but will be easy for you to trim out manually at the end okay so typically in wood people will just chop those out with a chisel or something at the end um, but crucially where are the tabs going to go now that's the uh, uh, option we have here to edit the tab so we can choose the position of those tabs and when I click that we actually cut away to the 2D view so we can see our toolpath in 2D you can see here this is the toolpath in red with the arrow indicating the direction of cut and it's outside of our original um, shape so um, and then we're looking here at the add tabs form so the add tabs form gives you two two routes really you can either use a, an automatic process to place the tabs either a fixed number of them or a fixed distance between them and you can click add tabs here to do that so that hopefully is relatively simple to uh, to get so you can just modify the number there or choose this option and put the distance between your tabs and that obviously then the number of tabs resulting will depend on the shape and the distance values you've set here I'm going to do something different though. I'm going to use the interactive tab entry and that essentially is sort of the other way of doing things uh, or at least you can do a bit of both actually. You can add your tabs with a constant number and then modify them in this method. But I'm going to just enter them uh, manually because it's perhaps the one that's least obvious from the form itself how it works. Uh, essentially as I move the mouse cursor over my uh, shape um, I'm getting a little tick appear next to the tab um, icon on my a cursor and that means that's a place where I can drop a tab so if I uh, just click there I can place the tab in that position and that position and that position so I can put four tabs on like so um, I can actually move over these tabs now and as the the cursor will change again to indicate that I can move this cursor around so I'm holding down the left mouse button now and I can drag the tab to a new position if I just click on it so I'm just left clicking it will delete it as well okay so with this method you've got complete freedom to choose uh, where you place your tabs <clears throat> and just close that form when you're done so the little T's here ultimately will be replaced by half inch long uh, eighth inch thick tabs so let's calculate that and take a look and here you can see our new toolpath now has got tabs in okay and if I just preview that selected toolpath uh, we can see at the bottom now rather than the piece flying out it's got some fairly substantial almost certainly a little bit too substantial um, tabs that will hold it in place and then at the end we would just manually chop those out perhaps with a, a chisel okay so that's uh, the tabs the only thing really left here is that you can modify the name of your toolpath at the point of creating it so we could call this cutout uh, and when we calculate that that's the name that will appear here but equally don't forget that you can modify the name 
uh, in the list subsequently without having to go back into the toolpath using a right click here and rename. Um, and you can go back to your toolpath as I've been demonstrating throughout this tutorial just by double clicking it on the list. Okay, so that is the basic 2D profile toolpath settings. I'm going to go on now, I'm going to turn on this uh, advanced ta uh, options here and we'll go through the more advanced options. Okay, so in the second part of this tutorial we're going to look at the advanced options on the profiling toolpath strategy and to uh, demonstrate a couple of the things I want to show I'm just going to modify our original artwork slightly. So I'm going to add in uh, a circle here and I'm going to add a couple of rectangles, one inside the original shape and one outside of the original shape. Okay, and then just to neaten things up, I'm going to just move that up a little bit so we've got them spaced out nicely. Okay, press F to refit the 2D view. Okay, so um, now what we've got is some shapes here which form a single part up here. So say this is a part which has got an external boundary and these are also waste material inside. So in other words, we want to cut holes uh, as well as the outer edge of this shape. And this one is just a separate shape on its own. Now what I want to demonstrate very quickly is that the profiling toolpath um, will cope with that quite happily. So let's start how we mean to go on now. I'm going to toggle on the show advanced toolpath options here and you should see a few extra options appear all the way along the form and we're going to look at those um, in this second half of this tutorial. Um, but let's start by simply selecting all of those shapes I just created. I'm going to cut them down to full depth of the material, so I'll just put Z in there and uh, leave everything else pretty much as default and calculate that. So here's our preview now and we can simply preview the selected toolpath and you can see that we have without any effort on our part effectively cut the shapes as you would expect. So as we start to go on you'll start to see that the um, profiling toolpath is intelligent enough to know when shapes are inside other shapes and it will slightly modify uh, the way that it treats those shapes um, as a result without you having to do anything. So it will deal with the fact that um, these shapes were clearly meant to be holes in the outer shape without you having to make any uh, changes to the toolpath. It's as simple as selecting everything and it will resolve those things for you. Okay, so let's reset the preview and close that down and we'll go back to our original toolpath to look at some of the other options. Okay, so the first thing to notice is that um, an extra section appeared under our tool um, setup here. So the tool uh, selection um, section of our pro toolpath, if you recall, it filled in for us the number of passes that it was going to use to cut down uh, through the material by looking at the tool definition. So it looked at the tool, it knew what the pass depth for that particular tool was, in this case eighth of an inch, divided it broadly by the um, material and uh, that's why we ended up with four passes. Okay, so if we look at that again, whoops, unselect the vectors. So that's why we've ended up with four passes down here. Let's uh, see though that although it tells us what the passes are, we can now edit those passes um, in a very accurate way with this additional bo box. So when I click the edit passes I get a, a new specify pass depths form comes up and the form shows me the passes that have resulted from that original calculation. So it knew that we could cut down by an eighth of an inch and it went eighth, quarter, um, three quarters, half an inch. Okay. Uh, the first thing we can do is we can actually select any of these uh, passes, so you can see them here being highlighted in red. So if I select one, I can actually move it slightly by just modifying the value there and shift it around. So this, the first thing you can do is simply um, edit the passes that have come to you. You can delete some, obviously, with this button, and you can begin to modify the, 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 the precise passes that we're using. Um, in the lower half of the form, we can populate the passes again. So if we clear all the passes up here, we can use two different methods to populate the form. Uh, the first one is to populate the list using the pass step. This is essentially the default system. So if you ever get stuck, this is the default system to use the pass steps that emerge from the tool database. So again, we get back exactly the same system. Okay, and it's showing me that they've got eighth of an inch pass, four passes, at an eighth of an inch per pass. So that's okay. But I want to show you a subtlety about the way that the passes are calculated. So I'm going to cancel out this form for a second. 
I'm going to go back into our tool and I'm going to say, let's say it doesn't quite make an eighth of an inch. It makes some value somewhat less than an eighth of an inch, say 0.124, so a tiny amount less. Click OK. A strange thing is that the passes have not changed. Okay, And if we look at the edit passes here, we'll find that it's put back exactly the same passes um, that we had before. Down here in the populate pass depth using um, the tool pass depth value, you can see that we've got 0.124 inches but it's still put in four passes at 0.125 inches per pass so what's going on here well, what's happening here is that the um, calculation process involves a heuristic which essentially says less passes is always better uh, to the to a point so if you can get away with doing less passes with a small change to the um, value that's put in the database then do it so by a few percent if we can actually increase uh, the pass depth slightly but therefore reduce the number of passes um, then that's worth doing and for most people that is true and it's, it's not an issue you need to worry about but occasionally it can surprise people they put in a very precise value for very precise reasons and doesn't seem to change the pass depth okay if you want to force exact tool pass depths uh, so you know exactly what you're doing and this 124 is really significant then you can click on this box here set passes again and what you'll find is now it goes down in exactly 0.124 passes but of course at the end you end up with a very very fine pass which catches the, the remaining part of the material block so effectively this 0 0.004 inch pass at the end uh, was being amortized across the other passes um, previously and now it's not so you have to come in and do a f and you're ending up with basically uh, an extra pass there uh, so you end up with five passes down one two three four five passes down there so uh, that still allows you to do that if you want to okay I'm going to assume that we want to just amortize that 0 0.004 inch extra across those passes and that's fine with me so that's one way of doing it that's the default way of doing it down here we can also simply do the number of passes independent of the tool let's always do six passes please and populate it that way and it will just divide the material thickness by the number of passes to give us what each pass depth will be okay so with these two set passes buttons here you can sort of pre-populate the form and then you can come back up here and, and edit it to your heart's content and you can add in or modify uh, any particular pass uh, that you happen to to want to change there there's also an additional option here to set the last pass thickness and this is significant um, if you're using a technique say uh, which is called onion skinning uh, so instead of putting in that's probably hefty let's do something a little bit more um, appropriate so say you're wanting to do um, onion skinning where what you're saying is that I want to leave material on for the very last pass uh, and instead of using bridges you're going to effectively leave a film of material in the very last pass of your um, job so that you can cut the piece out and it's held in place by that film of material uh, then you can apply that using the specified pass depths form here okay so I'm going to switch that off and I'm going to go back to my basic setup and close that down but that's how you edit passes okay so you've got complete control over these passes in fact using that option okay so we'll move on now to machine vectors so the machine vectors section here is largely the same all the way down to this point uh, it's exactly the same as in the basic mode for this tool uh, and we've covered inside outside and the climate conventional milling options here what's new though is an additional offset uh, that you can apply to your toolpath which will essentially allow you to under or overcut deliberately um, the artwork that you've selected so if we just go back at the moment I'm going to go back to the 2d view we can see here that we're cutting outside and so what's happened here is the toolpath is up offset out by exactly the radius of the tool so the tool is cutting the shape um, exactly to the size of the original geometry if we add uh, an additional offset here say quarter of an inch and apply that again what you'll see if we come back to the view is that we've now offset way outside that and we've allowed effectively another quarter of an inch of material to be left on outside of our original geometry which can be very handy this is an opportunity to look at what it's done with the inside shapes as well so uh, what you can see here um, straight away is that this rectangle it's also offset outwards so that's no problem but these two shapes the circle and the rectangle the toolpath is on the inside automatically the software knows that it's wanting to cut these shapes out uh, as internal holes in the job okay and we haven't had to do anything 
special there. It just knows that this shape is inside this shape and therefore it must be representing a hole in the shape. Uh, and you can see therefore that the additional offset outwards here is represented here as an inwards offset um, to allow the finished part to be quarter of an inch inch bigger in all directions when it's finished. So essentially the point of this is that you don't need to worry about this. This just happens automatically for you okay? from the, the nature of the selection. Um, we'll come on in a second to look um, exactly at why we would use an offset, an example of why we might use an offset in a minute when I come down to look at uh, chamfering the corners of our parts, uh, which is an interesting technique. But for now, you uh, can just see that that is adding uh, a quarter, an extra quarter of an inch boundary. Uh, incidentally, while we're on this, you can put negative values in there and you can overcut your part. In other words, you can cut the part so it ends up smaller than it was intended by adding a negative value here. And that can be useful if you know that this part, for example, is going to fit inside a pocket and you want to allow some ease, easement because the pocket can't be varied, then you might want to deliberately overcut the part slightly. Uh, and that's where you can set it. I'm going to put that back to zero for now. Okay, so let's cut back to, before we go on to this next section, let's cut back to the 3D view and have a quick look at what's happened now that we've got multiple shapes. Okay, so what's happened is uh, we've got these additional um, linking moves here. We've had to cut these shapes in a sequence, and so the um, uh, software has had to decide uh, how to join these shapes up. And what it's broadly done is, is picked um, convenient points that are close to the preceding shape. Uh, and found uh, a good route through which um, s tries to minimize the amount of um, time that the tool spends in the air and not actually cutting. Okay, so it's doing relatively short paths between the shapes, uh, but with some um, heuristics in there to uh, minimize the calculation times and things. We'll come on and talk about order, which has a similar issue uh, in a minute. But what we can do, if you're not happy with where it's decided to plunge, so it's decided to plunge here based on where it's linked the tool paths together, that might not, in your view, be the best place. Okay, And um, what we might find, for example, is that it's chosen to plunge um, Normally it won't choose a, a really bad place, but it might choose to plunge on on a side, for example, where you would be f uh, afraid that it might leave a witness mark. So what we can do, let's go back to our original artwork here. I can press an N to node edit our artwork, and I'm going to move the start point uh, up here to the uh, top right for this particular shape. Okay, and we can turn on to use the start vector start points. So what we're saying now is don't try and work out um, how to join our moves up. In fact, always go to the start point that I've specified. Okay, and when we recalculate, uh, well, we need to recalculate that with everything selected. So let's just do that. Select all and re whoops, recalculate that. Okay, now you can see that it's gone and it's done some other calculation now where it's used exactly our start points. Okay, so it's come back and we can see that the start point for this rectangle is that bottom left corner top right corner, top. Um, it's made in this case some rather crazy linker moves, right? But you, you can use that option when you want to force the linking to, uh, to go to particular places. And it's particularly significant because it's where the plunge will occur on that shape. Okay, and we might just have a, a reason of our own that we need to plunge in this bottom left corner for that shape. And we can force it with that option. So that was using the vector start points and not optimizing with um, the software's own algorithm. Okay. OK, so that's the machine's uh, vector section. Now we're going to move down to this area, which is actually a series of tabs. So it deals with many of the additional parts uh, to, of your toolpath, so the non-cutting parts of your toolpath typically, or at least the peripheral parts of your cutting toolpath. Um, the first three pages, so you can get to the different pages by clicking these tabs at the top here. And the first three pages are pretty much uh, uh, the same. In fact, everything except the ordering pretty much works the same way, which is that each page has a checkbox which essentially decides whether that page is active or not. So you can say to, I'm going to be interested in leads or ramps, or I'm going to be working with sharp corners, etc. So the starting point to enable these features is to say, yeah, I'm going to be adding tabs. Okay, and when you click that on, now the options become available. Okay, and we'll start with tabs. It's the simplest one. Um, compared to the basic uh, version we looked at earlier in the sense that it only has one additional option here which is to create 3D tabs as opposed to the, the sort of square 2D tabs we had before. If I switch that on 
uh, and we look at our tabs. Remember, we we put four tabs before on the external edge of that shape. Okay, so all I'm going to do now is recalculate with that 3D option put on and take a look at the results. And here you can see we've got these V shape moves now in the last pass. And if I preview that toolpath and take a look in 3D, we can see that what we end up here is a sort of um, ridge. Uh, instead of the square lift and uh, so we had a retract and a plunge okay and the benefit of the 3d tabs there's two sort of benefits really the the main benefit is that the tool will go up and over these uh, shapes much more quickly because there won't be any requirement for a retract and a plunge a sort of peripheral benefit is that often people find that they are actually easier to remove as well okay so the 3d tabs is an additional option that you have in the advanced mode um, the length and thickness are the same, except the thickness now really only relates to the ridge. So the thickness of the shape will be at that ridge. Um, uh, the length is still broadly from uh, the beginning of the rise to the uh, second dip here. Okay, so that's uh, 3D tabs. Okay, so the leads tab uh, is the next thing we're going to look at. So we enable the lead options here with add leads and we have two options to start with, either a straight line lead or a circular lead. Uh, now the leads are going to uh, essentially use the waste material to plunge the tool into and then come into our actual main cut against the surface of our final part uh, with a conventional cutting move. And the, the benefit of this is to avoid any sort of witness or dwell marks uh, against the surface that we're actually going to have on our final part. So I'll start with the simplest option which is a straight line lead in and you can simply set the angle of the, the lead in relative to um, the main cutting pass so we'll have a 30 degree lead in here. The lead length which is going to be just quarter of an inch, little short ones and we won't lead out initially just to have a look at everything. So we'll calculate that and we can see now that we've got little extra tails if you like uh, been added. So the plunge move is going to occur here and then we're going to come in and cut um, against our actual um, surface uh, as part of a conventional cutting move. So the crucial fact is that the plunge move, this light colour here, shows that the plunge is occurring away from the surface edge. Okay, uh, And that's the basis of a lead. We can also have it lead out. So if I come back in here we can have lead out. It just makes this symmetrical. Calculate that. And now we see that the retract moves can also be taken away from the surface material as well. So uh, again notice that the internal shapes here, the waste material is the inside bit and so the leads um, um, and lead, lead in and lead outs are both against the waste material there. Uh, let's just reset and re preview that so we can we can see it more clearly. OK, so you can see that we've done the plunges and retracts away from our, our job. So that's the basis of a linear lead-in, um, a straight line lead-in. We can also have circular lead-in, which we define in terms of, instead of an angle now, we can just say um, what the radius is of our uh, arc in. Recalculate that. It's going to struggle a little bit to lead in, particularly on this circle here, because it's the radius is going to be less than the circle. But we get the principle, you can see, um, so yeah, the radius is greater than the circle, but you can see the principle here that we've just got nice curves. In general, um, arcing in and out is is preferable to straight lines, unless you have a particular reason not to do that. Okay, so that's uh, the basics of lead in, lead out. The only other value we've got on here is an overcut distance. Uh, so at the moment, what's happening is we're going on our profile all the way around back to the place where we started and immediately leading out. We can also set this um, with a value to, um, and it's going to complain again about the arc, but let's leave that for a second. We can set this with a value so that in fact we actually go past our original start point by a small amount. And again, the benefit of having um, an overcut distance here is that we um, we actually cut past the place where we uh, first entered and started the cutting pass and we'll clean up any um, artifact that we might have as a result of that transition. Um, so again you can set this just just to uh, overcut your start point, start and end of your, your toolpath slightly. Uh, so that's the leads. Uh, now I'm going to leave the leads switched on for a second but what we'll see is that the lead setting here has an effect on ramps. Okay, So as we move on to ramps uh, we'll come back and look at leads again because there are certain ramp options which interact with the leads. Okay, so moving across to ramps then, 
we can add ramps to our toolpath as well. So we looked at ramps uh, in the basic form in the earlier part of this tutorial and the basic ramp that you get is the zigzag so the, the ramping is about uh, easing into the material in terms of z-depth uh, by doing some additional moves rather than plunging straight down in. Uh, so the zigzag is essentially taking us back and forward as we go down in depth. We can also choose smooth here and the smooth allows a single transition in at a given angle okay so you'll go in with just one pass um, if you look at the options here the zigzag and the smooth you could also specify to ramp on the lead in so we can include the lead in as our ramp because we've got lead ins um, selected uh, on the leads tab here we can select this option and just simply um, ramp according to the already defined distances and angles for the lead in and that's the convenient way of doing it if I switch off leads okay and come back to ramps then obviously that option is disabled and we would need to specify the angle and distance for the ramp um, ourselves uh, here. Okay, so these two settings do interact a little bit. They also interact when I've got add lead switched on. If I come into ramps, spiral is not available as an option. And the reason is that the spiral option is not compatible with any sort of leads. Uh, and if you need if you want to use the spiral ramping, then again you need to come back to leads, turn them off go back to ramps and now spiral becomes available uh, because it replaces everything essentially with a spiral uh, which is both which is uh, essentially going to uh, is not going to be possible to do if you've also got uh, leads going on at the same time okay so that's ramping um, and again just be aware of the relationship with ramping and leads now the next tab, order, is slightly different from the previous ones in the sense that rather than looking at the individual toolpaths themselves, it's looking at the sequence that we choose to machine each independent uh, profiling pass. So um, by default what we're going to do, a bit like the vector start points um, option up here, is that the software by default is, is always working to minimize the time in the air if it can. Um, so it will always try and choose sensible sequence, so it'll do the first shape uh, that it finds um, closest to the bottom left corner or the origin in this case and then move uh, around the shapes in a sensible way uh, but just as with the use vector start points we can switch off that that optimization and we can force certain options ourselves uh, the most manual of which is that you can choose the vector selection order and that will essentially force the linking uh, sequence to follow the order in which you selected the vectors that you use to machine. So when we came into this uh, toolpath, remember, we, we actually select the vectors like so uh, and you can hold down the shift key and you can force them to select in a certain order. OK, and when you come to calculate, that will be the order that they will be machined in. You can also choose to say in this case that we're going to go broadly from the leftmost to the rightmost, from the bottom to the top, that we can indicate that there is a, is a grid that the uh, software should try and follow. So if the, we know our artwork is broadly laid out in a grid, that's good. And then shortest path obviously just tries to minimize the um, airtime uh, between the linker moves. So that allows you to take full control of the sequence of um, that the profile toolpaths will be um, created for a, any given set of geometry that you pass in. Now the final tab is probably the most specialist thing uh, that you're likely to encounter on this form and so what I'm going to do, I'm going to show uh, some very different artwork for this because uh, it's really most important if you want to um, cut out tech shapes uh, for sign making and things. Okay, so we're going to stop there for a second. I'm going to close this form down. I'm just going to generate uh, more throw that toolpath away and instead I'm going to delete these uh, vectors and I'm going to create some text for us to look at or at least a letter for us to look at. Um, so I'm opening up the text and we're going to look at a capital letter E and I'm going to use a nice serif font uh, like Times New Roman or something like that. Capital E, apply that and the reason I'm using a capital E like this if we use F9 bring that in the center close that down now, uh, is that it's got internal and external sharp corners. Okay, so it's got internal corners here that are sharp and external corners here. And I want to show uh, how you can use a technique here to machine this letter um, where we can keep, sh we can bevel the edges or eff effectively make a chamfered edge that extends beyond the top surface. So the letter here uh, boundary 
is going to represent the top surface of our letter shape and we want to nicely um, uh, bevel out to a, a wider edge. So I'm going to go back into my profile here and I'm going to start by choosing a tool which is actually shaped. So let's start by choosing a V-bit carving tool, so say a big V-bit tool like so. And we're going to run around the outside of our text. We're not going to use any of the optimizations before. We don't want tabs, no leads, no ramps. The order, we're happy for it to use the default ordering system. And uh, I'm going to leave these switched off for a second and just calculate that. I don't want to cut down to full depth in this particular case. I'm just going to dip into the surface by quarter of an inch and calculate that. Let's reset the preview and preview what we've just created. OK, so you can see here that it's, it's quite a nice effect straight away. And if we were to come back in and cut this shape out now, we'd have nice beveled letters. But hopefully you can see a few issues that uh, are not quite as good as you'd like to be if you were being really uh, precise or if you wanted to make a proper precise chiseled shape here. And that is that these corners are all radius. So here's an example of an internal radius corner. And here is an example of an external corner that's become radius. So in this case, the top shape is fine, the top surface is fine, but the base shape is 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 being radiused out. And here, the top surface is actually no good because that's being radiused out. The original artwork there has got a sharp edge, and we would like to represent that in our finished part. So let's come back in, and instead we can switch on corners now. Let's switch on the sharp external corners first and recalculate that. And you can see now that what we've done is created a toolpath that doesn't roll around the edges here. It's sharp at the edges. And when we preview that, so reset the preview and preview the selected shape, now we're getting a much sharper finish on those external corners. And the uh, tool is not being allowed to roll around the shape and, and blur that edge off. It has to come out and come back in again. And that has the effect of producing these really nice chiseled edges. Uh, you can also see though that we've not affected the internal corner. That's still unchanged. So let's go back in and also turn on internal corners. And when I do that, it also gives me this other value, which we'll come back to in a second. But let's see what that does. So what that's done straight away is added some additional moves. OK, and these are uh, what we call corner sharpening moves. The tool with a sharp tip is going to retract into that corner because obviously the problem here is that at the depth we've asked it to cut, uh, it can't get into that sharp corner, but it can, because it's a conical tool, retract up and just produce a nice chiseled shape for us. So let's see that. Reset the preview and preview the whole thing again. And now we can see this is looking really nice. So that we have an internal corner which has been created for us by those uh, corner sharpening additional moves on the inside of the, the letter there. So that's looking pretty good. Now we'd like to cut this shape out, of course, uh, and what we want to do, therefore, is know where we've, we need to cut in terms of offset, because obviously this is the geometry we've got, but the toolpath has now created for us a, a natural edge which we'd like to cut out, which is externally offset from the original ge geometry. So what is that distance? Okay, That distance is the product of the tool we've used and the depth we've cut, uh, which might be quite tricky to calculate. I mean, actually, in this case, I've used a 90 degree tool, so it's relatively easy to calculate yourself. But uh, why would we want to do the math? Let's get the computer to do the math for us. So I go back to my corners tab, and it's telling me this value here is a bit unusual because it's not a value you enter. It's a value that you want to read back. And it's telling me that the allowance for our cutout tool should be 0.25, quarter of an inch. And that is the distance here to the edge of the chamfer that we've made. OK, so I just want to keep a copy of that. So what I'm doing, I highlight it in that edit box. And I'm pressing Control-C to copy it to the clipboard, just like you would any text in Windows. But I'm going to close this form down now and create a totally new toolpath. OK, and I'm going to select in it the uh, a small end mill quarter of an inch end mill. OK, and I'm going to actually I probably want a smaller one than that, but this will show the principle anyway. Uh, I'm going to this one is going to cut down to the full depth. It's going to go outside the shape, I'm going to climb mill it, but we're going to put that offset in. Crucially, we're going to offset out by that 0.25 an inch so that our profile will actually run around the edge where we've chamfered. OK, and that's all there is to it. We calculate that now and you can see clearly that it's done that for us nicely. And uh, with that one, I can now preview that selected toolpath, which runs down to the base of the material. And that's given us our finished letter with nicely beveled uh, 
external edges like that. And so if you're a sign maker or you're working on something which you want nice chiseled text like that, that's a great technique and it's all 2D so it's really fast to cut. You can see a slight radius here, that's because I've used quite a big tool. We'd probably want to use a smaller tool just to, to clean those internal edges out, but it shows the principle here and to the eye most people would not even see that. Okay, so the very final thing I want to talk through, which is an advanced option on profiling, if we go back in, is at the bottom here, we have the option to have a vector selector. Okay, so up until now, we've been creating the artwork in the 2D view, uh, maybe one or two bits, and we've been selecting them ourselves uh, before we go into the profiling toolpath, or once we're in the profiling toolpath. Uh, but what might happen if you've got externally generated artwork, um, so if you've got a CAD package for example that's producing things you want to profile, then the vector selector is a really powerful tool. And so I'm going to just highlight it here, although there is an entirely separate tutorial on the vector selector which you should go and look at really. So I'm just going to touch on it just to, to show that it is here. Um, the vector selector allows us to use the computer to make selections for us. And so we can add on selections that for example we only want open open vectors or we only want closed vectors or both okay and if they're closed vectors we might only want circles and we might only want circles of a certain diameter okay so you can choose various options down here you can also have things select on uh, only certain layers in your design or on all the layers that you happen to make visible and in this way you can set your artwork up and then have the computer make selections of all of the um, uh, items of geometry that fulfill these criteria. So a classic example would be, for example, that you get a multi-layered design in from a CAD package which has circles of a fixed diameter that you want to um, profile or cut out. Uh, you can find all those circles with this selector. Okay, but I'm not going to go into great deals about the vector selector because it's dealt with in a separate tutorial. So if this looks like it's of interest to you, please do go away and uh, follow the specific tutorial on the vector selector. Okay, so that's everything really uh, in the Advanced Profiling Toolpath options. As I said, it's basically a conceptually very straightforward idea to be able to machine your geometry, but as you can see, it's really useful for such a variety of jobs that um, we've got a lot of options here to cater for all of the different needs that you might have in the way that you go about machining profiles, from being very production oriented and worrying about speed and efficiency to worrying about tool wear and tear, or cutting it to the uh, much simpler options here and just doing very simple cutout passes that finish off your sign or uh, the, the job that you're working on. And as I say, if you don't really need to worry about sharp corners or the ordering and things like that, then really I would recommend twitch that off and uh, you'll find that the, the workflow will be much more efficient for you without having to worry about those additional options. I hope overall the tutorial has been good. Uh, thank you for listening.